Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar on moving away from family separation, cross-system strategies to support young children and families at risk of child welfare involvement. Um, I just want to ask you as you enter the room, if you would go ahead and put your name and where you're from into the chat so that we can know who's here. And also, you might see some friends. You never know. <laughs> We've had that happen. Um, we're just going to give it another minute or so, just so that everybody can get on board, and then we'll we'll start. If this is your first time with us, welcome. We hope you find this really both informative and enjoyable. And um, if you have been here before, welcome back. We're really happy that you came back, and um, we're excited for the information um, that we're going to share with you today. So just give it a little bit more. Hi, Erin. Um, I see people coming up there that I know as well. So just uh, keep on putting your name and your location in there. And um, we'll start in just a second. Okay, everybody can continue to do that. And um, I will go ahead. This is um, the second webinar in our series. And the title of this webinar is Building Upstream Support Strategies for Prenatal to Three Child Welfare Prevention. I am your moderator, Cynthia Tate with the BUILD Initiative. So welcome. Let's go. So the objectives for the webinar series are these, to raise awareness about young children and their families involved or at risk for involvement with the child welfare system, to educate participants about the racial disparities in family separation from child welfare involvement and promote opportunities and upstream strategies for prevention for families and communities. And lastly, to provide examples of cross systems collaboration on behalf of our youngest youth. The objectives for webinar two are these, to learn about the Center for the Study of Social Policies Blueprint for Equity-Centered Anti-Racist Policies Supporting the Health and Well-Being of Children and Families, and their partnership with states engaged in efforts to develop a continuum of supports for young children and families, and to learn about New Jersey's and Nebraska's work to build a continuum of prevention, while also working on programmatic and policy transformations their child welfare system. Hi, Dan. I see people popping up and I just have to say hi. Okay, let me introduce our presenters for today. Um, our first presenter is Shadi Hushiar, Center for the Study of Social Policy. Shadi, can you just wave so they know who you are? Well, I can see your name, I guess. So thank you. Welcome, Shadi. Thanks so much. Our second presenter is Jennifer Scala the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you for, well, uh, welcome, and thank you for being with us today. And our third is Mary Coogan with the Advocates for Children of New Jersey. Thank you, Mary, for being with us. Um, I wanna go ahead and introduce our translator. So this is B Torres, and um, B will be um, doing the Spanish translation. B, you wanna tell everybody how that works? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Cynthia. So my name is B. My pronouns are she, her, Aya. I'm with the Community Language Cooperative, or the CLC, and I want to thank you for your commitment to language justice. In a moment, we will be activating the simultaneous interpretation function on Zoom, and you'll be able to select the language of your heart. Uh, you'll see a globe icon at the bottom of your screen. You'll be able to select either English or Spanish. If you're fully bilingual, you don't need to choose a language. I'll go ahead and repeat this in Spanish, and then we can jump back in. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Vi Torres. Mi pronombre es ella. Yo seré su intérprete con la Community Language Co-op, o la CLC. Les agradezco su compromiso con la justicia del lenguaje, lo cual significa que todos tenemos el derecho de hablar en el idioma de nuestro corazón. En un momento se activará la interpretación y aparecerá un globo terráqueo en su pantalla de Zoom. Por favor, de hacer clic en ese icono y elija el inglés o el español como su idioma de corazón. Si usted es bilingüe, no es necesario escoger un idioma. Muchas gracias. Ya podemos comenzar. Thank you very much. Jonathan, we can go ahead and activate the interpretation now. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much. I want to also mention that we are recording these sessions. Um, and um, in case you came in after that announcement was made. So now, who are you? We have uh, 421 people uh, who have registered for this webinar, 45 states and territories, including DC and the Virgin Islands and Bangladesh. And you're from state agencies, early care and education, um, departments and programs, economic security, uh, human services, health, public health, mental health, maternal and child health. Um, you are bilingual and uh, grassroots organizers. You're early educators, home visitors, navigators, researchers and evaluators, philanthropists, family support specialists, service coordinators. You're, you, you have a lot of different positions and occupations. And so that's really exciting because we really uh, enjoy it when folks are able to um, look at this work and take it in from various different viewpoints. So welcome everybody, thank you. Next, um, this is what you told us about why you registered for this webinar. Um, for networking, connections, information on strategies and projects that are moving the needle toward inclusive family child focus, finding new resources, better understanding how to transform systems and how to partner with child welfare more effectively. Great reasons to register. <laughs> All right. We want to put in a shameless plug right here for our um, PN3 Exchange. Uh, the Exchange is an online community where you can with your peers, find resources, share resources. Um, we have over 2,700 members from all 50 states. So it, it itself is a great resource. So that's our shameless plug for today. Next. So here's how you can participate. Um, as we started, introduce yourself in the chat um, and then put your questions for the panelists into the chat or the Q&A. Um, you can put those questions into the Q&A before we get to the Q&A section of our, of our agenda. Um, but we just wanted to let you know that we will be watching them, they'll be monitored and we'll pull them out um, so that we can ask those questions of our panelists. And then at the end, we have a survey and we do ask you to complete the survey. It will pop up in your browser when we're done and it will um, give us uh, some feedback on how we did. And uh, that's really important to us. We use that feedback for real. It's, um, it's a um, it's an earnest effort on our part. Next. So I want to introduce now uh, Shadi Hushyar from CSSP. Shadi? Great. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, and thanks to uh, our partners at Build. And uh, it's really great to see Jenny uh, and Mary here today, uh, our partners on the PCI CSSP partnership, which I'll talk a little bit about today. So my name is Shadi Hushyar. I am a senior associate at the Center for the Study of Social Policy where I lead our health justice policy efforts. For those of you who don't know, CSSP is a national policy organization committed to advancing the economic security, health, and well-being of children, youth, and families. Uh, we do this work by partnering closely with young people and with parents to identify and co-develop solutions to transform public policies and systems so that they are more effectively able to support families and advance policies to meet their expressed needs. Um, in all of our work, we take an anti-racist approach uh, to ensure that all children, youth, and families are supported without punishment and surveillance, um, that they can access the government programs for which they are eligible, and that they have the freedom to lead healthy, full, and happy lives. You can go to the next slide. So in our work, we're focused on policies that promote a continuum of support for families. So I'll talk a little bit about that continuum now. Uh, this continuum is really, as we envision it, a continuum that meets the needs of children and families in the community um, and not in deep end systems. It's also coordinated and comprehensive and it minimizes barriers for families and it's anti-racist. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Um, and so while often the work that really is a part of this is, is 
uh, referred to as prevention, um, as in preventing bad things from happening, our frame is really grounded in the strengths of children and families and recognizes that systems really need to do more to enhance protective factors and support child and family well-being. And so we think about family supports. Um, and we talk about support as in supporting children and families and having what they need to thrive and keeping them from ever coming to the attention of child welfare or other deeper end systems. We can go to the next slide. So much of what I um, will do today is talk with you all about a blueprint uh, that we published um, in 2021. And it was really intended to be used as a guide for states and communities um, as they build a continuum of supports for young children and their families. In developing this blueprint, um, our team conducted research, including interviews with early childhood and child welfare experts, with advocates, with system leaders, um, in nine states and jurisdictions um, with prenatal to three coalitions that were supported by the Pritzker Children's Initiative. The blueprint provides states and communities with uh, a set of principles, uh, with strategies and with guiding questions to support efforts to build and enhance a continuum of supports for children prenatal to three and their caregivers. Um, in the blueprint, we identify a number of strategies. Uh, these are universal, specific, and targeted, um, and I'll talk through that briefly with you all. But we'd encourage you to take a look at the blueprint to see some specific examples of ways jurisdictions are doing this work. We also include throughout the blueprint opportunities for states and jurisdictions to take an anti-racist approach in their efforts to support child well-being and prevent child welfare involvement. And I'll just note that um, the structure and administration of any continuum uh, will obviously look different, as you all know, from state to state. But really, regardless of a state or community um, organ how they're organized, the key to building a continuum of supports is that commitment that is required from leadership and really ensuring that the infrastructure exists to support these efforts. So we can go to the next slide. So these were a set of guiding principles we developed and included in the blueprint. I'm just going to talk about a few of these that really served as a foundation for the work that we later did with several PCI states, um, including uh, Nebraska and New Jersey. Um, and so I'll just highlight those. The first is really to establish a shared vision. So to, to promote a continuum, a comprehensive continuum, it's really critical that all partners, um, so state, county, community-based organizations, are all contributing to a shared vision uh, for implementation and clear goals as to what the state, the county, or community is really trying to achieve for children prenatal, the three and their caregivers. So in this way, each system and community partner can really clearly identify how their work fits within this broader vision, where they see opportunities for partnership, where there are gaps that must be filled um, to achieve that vision and goals. And I think sometimes we assume that the vision is shared, uh, but I think often it requires work to, to really do that intentional work of setting the, the shared vision together. Another is to partner across systems to break down silos. So we often talk about this. It's actually quite hard to do. To implement strategies to support that common vision really requires system partners to commit to breaking down those silos. So increasing communication, sharing data, leveraging financing mechanisms. Um, when we operate in those silos, it really prevents systems from taking that holistic approach to serving young children and families, and it creates unnecessary barriers for families who need to access supports. Um, and also when agencies break down silos, it creates opportunities to leverage resources like data to inform investments and potential financing streams. Another one that I'll highlight is to promote community-driven strategies through meaningful engagement with families and communities. Um, so promoting well-being and preventing child welfare involvement for young children really requires meaningful engagement of families and com communities to identify gaps and develop and implement strategies to address those. This means that families have to be engaged in information gathering and decision making and implementation processes. It's really across that range of activities that requires the engagement um, and partnership with families. And a final one I'll highlight is to really implement multiple approaches um, and recognize that this work requires long-term commitment. So as we all know, there's not one singular service or approach that will meet the needs of 
uh, all children and families. And so states and communities have to implement really an array of supports and services across the continuum to ensure all children and families are able to meet their needs, regardless of where within that continuum they're looking for support. Um, and as we all again know, change doesn't happen overnight. So really thinking about how we build and enhance that continuum of supports requires the long-term investments and that commitment to the shared vision. So again, these principles help to guide our work with several PCI states, which I'll talk about briefly, and which I think Jenny and Mary will likely share more about as well. We can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, we had um, in the blueprint outlined uh, strategies that are universal, that are more specific, um, and that are targeted. So I'll talk a little bit about universal first. So these, as we would assume are those that, that include access to services, supports, and opportunities for all children and families to promote health and well-being. These supports are really critical to creating that foundation uh, for well-being for young children and families and preventing involvement with child welfare in a child's early years and as they continue to grow. But we know that a lack of found meaningful foundational universal supports for families that systemic racism and that failures of many child and family serving systems actively bring Black, Native, Latinx, immigrant uh, children and families to the attention of child welfare for what's also often classified as neglect. And we all know the research has shown that nearly half of families who have their children removed from their homes have trouble paying for basic necessities like food and rent. So as states work to advance goals related to universal supports for young children and families, we think an anti-racist approach is really critical to thinking about truly transforming our systems to address those inequities and disparate outcomes around health, around early learning, education, um, child welfare involvement. Um, in terms of strategies, as you can see in these universal um, supports, a lot of these are focused around health equity. One that I'll highlight is around removing barriers for families of color who are seeking access to community-based resources. So families who seek uh, to access resources often face barriers in uh, identifying which services exist in their community and navigating eligibility criteria. This is often because we have these fragmented, disconnected approaches to prevention and really complicated eligibility criteria that are established by policy and systems that don't recognize um, that uh, you know, families have these holistic needs. So one, um, one jurisdiction as an example of, of ways that um, they're implementing strategies, they developed a navigation service to support all families with children three and under, regardless of income in accessing the supports and services they want and need. And outreach um, happened with families at five key points. So during pregnancy, within a few weeks of the family coming home from the hospital and when the child reaches age one, two, and three to ensure that they have this on ongoing support. So we can go to the next slide. So in terms of specific supports, these supports provide um, services, opportunities for children and families with specific identified factors that are often associated with poor health, with early learning challenges, with well-being outcomes. Um, so again, ideally, universal supports are providing enough resources for everyone to thrive, but because systemic and institutional racism often marginalize families of color and families living in poverty, um, we have these more specific supports that are needed um, to ensure families have what they ha what they need to thrive. So while the majority of poor families never come to the attention of child welfare, poverty is still the greatest threat to child well-being and a predictor of child welfare involvement. For these families who are disproportionately families of color, key to supporting them outside of child welfare is through specific supports that mitigate the impact of, of poverty and other factors. So as an example, increasing household financial security or improving the ability of parents to meet their children's basic needs like food, shelter, medical care are really foundational goals in this area of the continuum. And so one strategy I'll highlight here um, is to increase access to quality child care and early learning centers for low-income young children. Um, we know that child care is a critical resource that supports parents, uh, that allows them to engage in work, promotes children's healthy development. However, decades of inadequate investment mean that most low-income families struggle to find and afford high-quality care. And this is particularly true for children and families of color who experience inequities as it relates to affordability, access to childcare subsidies, 
and the availability of childcare in their communities. Um, and research shows that childcare is uh, least affordable for Black and Latinx families with low incomes. So as an example of a strategy in one jurisdiction, they're using funds um, to provide early care and education opportunities ranging from home-based services to center-based early education services to school child care partnerships for children birth to three um, who are at risk of not being ready for kindergarten with a focus on both parent and child outcomes. And the work is funded through braided public and private dollars and each child care program is locally managed to ensure that the services meet the needs of the community. We can go to the next slide. Uh, so targeted supports are, are just that they're meant to be very specific to meet the needs, um, the specific needs of uh, families uh, and children. For example, uh, you know, thinking about child abuse and neglect prevention. Ideally, all children and families would be able to, again, have their needs met through universal and specific supports. But we know that for many families, uh, disproportionality um, and disproportionately children and families of color, there are gaps in upstream supports and needs can go unmet. And families' unmet needs often lead to a substantiation of neglect and family separation through child welfare. So the goals of targeted support really have to fill in those gaps. They have to meet those unmet needs and they have to implement kind of targeted child abuse and neglect strategies in order to keep families of color from unnecessary deeper end involvement and prevent family separation. Many PCI states have set goals of working with their child welfare agency to support implementation of targeted supports through Family First, um, but we know that in many states, early childhood and child welfare have not yet established a really sustainable partnership to move targeted strategies forward. So just an example of a strategy here, uh, is to provide targeted community-based support to families at higher risk of child welfare involvement. Again, research has consistently shown risk factors associated with child welfare involvement include living in a high poverty neighborhood, social isolation, parental stress, family and community violence. Often families at higher risk of involvement with child welfare are disconnected from existing supports and services. And so it's really important to take a proactive, non-adversarial approach to serving these families. Um, and states can do that by using data to identify which communities have higher rates of reports and look at how they can better support, provide targeted services to families outside of the child welfare system in those communities. So as an example, in one state, um, during, pen, during COVID, as a result of the decrease in the reports that they were getting um, around child welfare, um, the state began implementing a pilot project in five zip codes that were traditionally high levels of reports, especially reports involving young children. And specifically, the state did outreach to families in these communities with no strings attached or threat of surveillance to support children and families in accessing services to meet their needs. Um, also, through the support of philanthropy, the state partnered with a community-based organization that uses a parent mentorship model and a benefit navigator to connect at-risk families to financial resources. So those are examples in each of the different um, areas of the continuum, and we can move to the next slide. So in the blueprint, uh, we um, outline some suggested steps and some questions that can help guide initial planning for anti-racist policy and practice development, and really thinking about how you identify and implement supports and services that will make a meaningful impact for young children and families of color. So some of our recommended steps are, again, starting by creating that shared vis vision for how we do this work. And there are questions you can ask to do that. We've, we've outlined them. Some of them include, you know, do cross-system and community-based partners share an understanding of our overarching goals? And does our shared vision clearly articulate a commitment to equity? A second is to ensure equity in representation and family and community engagement and decision making. So we talked about this earlier, but really thinking about the system and community based organizations and partners, community based partners that are at the table to inform and guide decision making and really thinking about who's missing our families at the table and engaged in a meaningful way. Another step is to understand the needs of young children and families of color. So really looking at your data, thinking about the needs of, of Black, Latinx, Native, immigrant children and families. What does the data tell us about outcomes and experiences? What family needs may not be met? 
um, where should we be looking in terms of really building out this continuum of supports? Um, another is to identify and develop anti-racist strategies. So really thinking about what policy changes are needed to promote the universal, the specific, the targeted supports for young children and families of color. What strategies will be effective in preventing them from falling through gaps and into deeper end involvement? And really thinking about sort of how those investments fit across the continuum, using tools like a race equity impact assessment or other tools to really ask the questions about your policies and practices as you're designing them. And then making sure that strategies are responsive to community needs. So thinking about uh, processes you have in place to, to help inform, uh, to, to use the, the feedback you're getting from families and communities to help inform and shed light on what's working, where there are opportunities for improvement. So we can go to the next slide. So using uh, the blueprint as our framework, uh, CSSB supported PCI sites in five jurisdictions um, to help uh, them think about building and implementing a PN to three plan, a prenatal three plan for a child welfare prevention system that incorporates anti-racist policies and practices and the voices of families to support well-being of infant, toddlers, and their families. So as part of this work, um, each of the sites convened a prenatal three child welfare working group. So they identified cross-system teams that were made up of state and community partners. These often included child welfare, Medicaid, health and behavioral health, home visiting, early care education, community-based partners, parents and families. They each developed the prenatal with three plan that identified um, their shared vision, their strategies, and their activities um, that would be used to support children prenatal with three and their families in their communities. Um, and really thought about kind of relevant strategies across agencies, across entity, entities and task forces that were engaged in this work. And then as we moved into year two, sites implemented components of that plan for serving infants, toddlers, and their families. They really focused on what are some of the child welfare primary prevention approaches that are grounded in anti-racist principles, thinking about system integration strategies that really reduce the silos we see across early childhood systems, thought about advocacy on early childhood and child welfare kind of policies and investments. Um, and then they also identified some sustainable practices to help them maintain that momentum of child welfare primary prevention approaches by thinking about opportunities to blend and braid financing, to integrate the whole family and whole child approaches and focus upstream. So again, as they did this work, they did develop a shared vision for the work um, and in terms of how they would be serving infants, toddlers, and families through, through this approach grounded in anti-racist principles. They explored those system integration strategies. They really thought about what they could advance through their PN to three plan. Um, and uh, so I'll leave it at that and hopefully um, we'll hear a little bit more from Jenny and Mary about that. I will say, yes, we can go yes. to the next it's slide. We're, okay, we're two, more, two more quick slides. I'll be really quick. <laughs> okay. um, the next slide just shows you a resource we used, um, a toolkit we developed to help support the states as they were um, doing their plan development and work. Um, so it included a couple of components, but just highlighting that. And then we can go to the next slide. Um, I did want to highlight just some of the things that we learned that I think won't be a surprise. One, it takes time and intentionality to do this work. Um, that it took time for states to really organize around the work, to assemble their teams, to identify their strategies, um, to, um, to think about how they do this work. It also requires um, really meaningful engagement of parents and caregivers, um, and that can, be, that can be hard to do. It requires investment, meaningful kind of planning, really thinking about how you do that work. And then we can go to the next slide. This is the last one. I'll just highlight one piece on. So in terms of moving forward, um, one of the things I want to emphasize is that families want to be served um, by those they trust in their communities. They don't want to be surveilled. And this work really requires to shift power and solutions uh, into communities. So as an example, in a jurisdiction we're working with now, they're standing up a support line for families with young children, and now they're expanding it to, to all children and families. They are using child welfare dollars, but they're sending those dollars upstream so the Department of Health is managing the support line, and they're connecting families to resources in communities. So child welfare is putting in dollars into this and building it. And in fact, they had discussions about not using a DHS number for the support line 
because they didn't want families to see the number and be hesitant to engage. So they're thinking about how to do this differently. And when we talk about this partnership between child welfare and early childhood, we have to think about where child welfare ends. You can use your data, you can use your resources to understand families' needs, but then send those resources upstream so that we're not engaging families unnecessarily in child welfare. And I'll end with that. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Shadi. Thank you very much. Um, just want to let everybody know before we move on that we will be um, making the slides all the whole entire deck of all three presenters available. I uh, will be sending that out along with the recording and any resources that our um, presenters um, want to send out. In addition, we will send out the bios. We have brief bio statements on each of our presenters and we'll send those out with the material. All right, so next. We have Jenny Scala from Nebraska. Jenny? Yes. There you are. Great. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. I'm and gonna thank you. Let you know that I'm going to give you a one minute um, warning in the chat. And um, also, I will come back on screen and raise my hand. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. Please All feel right. free to interrupt me at any time because <laughs> I'm on my phone, as you know, which I'm sorry about that. But Thank you for this opportunity and thank you, Shadi, for putting so much forward of our model and our work together. I do miss the TA and the work with Pritzker and CSSP um, and even to be here today just to continue our journey is, is incredible. So thank you for letting us be on today. So I'm Jennifer Scull. I'm a Executive Vice President at Nebraska Children and Families Foundation. Um, we were founded due to the Family Preservation Act over 20 27 years ago, and we were um, established to strengthen families through community engagement. And so at the time when I started about 18 years ago, um, we were one of the states with the highest out of home care rate. So even though we were founded for that, it took us some time to really get our hands around the strategies and the work really needed to keep families together and focus in on the strengths of, of the work and what's needed in communities. So we spent a number of years um, learning with communities, with families that had been involved with the child welfare system, and especially our young adults who were aging out, who were becoming parents themselves. And so we are happy to show you in this in this presentation the, the, the degree, the decrease we've seen over the years, but just to know that we were starting off at a place we, 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 were, we knew we had a, a real issue and needed to do more. So next slide, please. Um, Bring Up Nebraska came out of this work by working with the communities, and it is a statewide effort that involves over 23 community collaboratives with all of their partners, as well as over 25 um, state partners, as well as some national partners have joined our, our work and our network. And it really is, again, to utilize and strengthen the local communities and that community well-being system by focusing on the strengthening of families, reducing the entry into the higher end systems of child welfare and juvenile justice and other higher end systems, increase those promotive and protective factors, those informal and formal supports, really focusing on the outcomes that children and families are thriving or wanting to thrive and wanting to focus in on by community um, participation in that and their involvement in that, and then focusing on that every child and that equality and the disproportionality that does come about when you're looking into the child welfare and those higher end systems. And lately, we've been really focusing a lot more on the community vitality and the economic development as a goal as well. So next slide, please. As I mentioned, we have a number of partners. Here's the, the different um, state partners, as well as private foundations and um, making it a public-private partnership. And we're recognizing that we cannot do this alone. And early in my time period, 18 years ago, when I went across Nebraska to the communities to learn from the parents and the young adults and others, we, we had um, what we called prevent child abuse chapters in place, but the leaders were telling me that nobody else sees it as their business. It's not, they don't need to be accountable for what's happening. Only the child welfare organization needed to be there and maybe some other volunteers. So we started on this journey of renaming and focusing on the well being, as well as making it be part of this Bring Up Nebraska messaging and all the work. So, next slide, please. 
There are now 23 as collaboratives, including our tribal nations, um, that cover all 93 counties in Nebraska. Again, been a journey and some are just starting off, um, came about during the pandemic. So not all are fully robust prevention systems, but have really amazing starts and partnerships available to do the work that they want to be accountable for and share in the success around for families. Um, next slide, please. The community collaboratives, um, here's just our definition of them. They are formal groups of partners. Some have over 500 partners in their community that join monthly meetings, um, but they do um, exist of cross sector systems, organization and leaders, but as well as grassroots organizations, the neighborhood leaders, community members, youth and families who really come around that shared common vision to achieve the equitable results, as well as then they all receive support from us for the backbone and the functions that exist in a collaborative to do the prevention work and really change the practices and to really focus on that data of uh, the population level outcomes around economic stability, um, education and career, as well as being safe and healthy. And then really working at the state level to transform those systems to change the community context for these results. We do at Nebraska Children offer through the journey um, a number of lifespan initiatives that are nested within these community collaboratives, um, starting with early childhood. So this work today um, was allowing us to really focus in on what's needed for our prenatal to three families and young children and really work inside our initiatives around home visitation, some of our social emotional work that supports our child care work, as well as our work to really build and enhance quality um, child care and early systems, um, as well as work with our first five Nebraska partners on our early childhood policy and advocacy. But as you can see, we also provide after school and summer programming, as well as then our older youth work that I mentioned before of youth that have experienced systems. And oftentimes, even now, um, we're seeing about 14 or 40 percent of the 14 to 26 year olds that we're working with um, are already pregnant or parenting. So then we are also making sure that this family and partner part strategies are really key to engaging the co-creation. So with the next slide um, with Thriving Families, it just allowed us to go deeper into our lived experience partnerships and really focus on the disproportionality that we were seeing. And that is how we came about focusing next slide on Douglas County. And Douglas County is where we were seeing the most um, unequitable results, and we wanted to engage families in our Pritzker partnership and CSSP to really look at what more we could do, especially with um, the early childhood systems in place and with families that have experienced the, uh, the lived experience that was needed to really change the system. Next slide. So we started with some data, and the data was around um, home visitation because a number of our parent partners and lived experience partners had said that they wish they would have had more um, involvement with home visitation, especially as they left um, the hospital with their child. And so we looked into that 19 of 33 zip codes um, did have some kind of home evidence based programming, but as you'll see, the most um, impacted individuals or priority families, only 1.9% actually received um, a home visitation support. So then we started looking into the substantiations, um, especially by medical providers, so we could look at the pathway that was occurring. And we, would, we saw that 82 of 485 reports by medical personnel were substantiated, which again is a, is a very small percent. Overall, the very, a very small percent of our 100,000 families that are involved, only 2,000 um, are actually substantiated right now. So again, we are unnecessarily putting families families in a pathway that doesn't get them the support. And so we engaged the partners, um, families, next slide, to be able to tell us what they really did want and co-created the strategies um, based on the home visitation needs were not being met. 
um, parental information request um, that they were wanting was really focused on then putting current trainings and things in place. Um, the disconnect in where and how parents wanted to participate um, was able to be addressed. And so we met the families with their children at their um, locations that they designed and wanted to be part of um, the inequality or inequity around poverty and place in, and race in Douglas County very much exists and again wanted to reach the families most impacted here and then we were able to engage the medical provider community and look at the reporting and the DHHS findings to to make sure we we're using all of that information to come up with the recommendations and the actions so next steps or next slide they are the steps um a universal home, a uh, universal resource center was suggested, and we did started one with the input of the parents and many others, and it's called the Bridge um, Family Resource Center Network. Um, they asked for a better ability to get their needs met by central navigation, um, not only by having bilingual staffing, but the capacity to be able to ensure that their goals got met right when they acknowledged what they were and what their needs were. Um, they really wanted trained and skilled and trusted bilingual home visitation staff, so spent much time on different trainings and support there, and we wanted to be sure that parents were able to self-determine their own learning opportunities, but are, again, their own goals. We have put in place a find help system, which I'll talk about here in more in a minute, and that finally they wanted that safe space wherever it is to communicate these needs, make sure there's co-creation going on in their own native languages and make informed decisions all the way up to our state partners that are, have been involved with this journey. Next slide. So the central navigation piece that was asked for, this is what it looks like. There is an opportunity, no wrong door. Um, all of those partners exist um, to be able to meet those needs. And within the find help system, it is now a system of record where the intake is able to be referred out to over 75 partners in Douglas County and close the loop to be able to say what need was needed, what and was it met. Um, there is a flexible, support service fund. I mentioned it's private and public funding to go to this. So the private funds oftentimes are able to meet the needs right away and not put on, be put on a wait list or, and sometimes really that's all that a family really needs, but it gives the hope and the support and, and is able to um, go to the next slide, please. These are the lists to meet the needs and keep families out of the child welfare system. Um, you'll see the biggest needs and requests are the housing and utilities, um, transportation, very common barriers that we see that still system development and work, but this data is, is, is constant and we can use it and you look at it and keep informing what we need to be working on. Um, next slide, just because of time, um, just want to go to the end here of the work that we're doing um, with this this journey and we call medical pathway and and it is uh, again working with the home visitation partners um, to increase that there is now a Douglas County plan to implement um, a universal home visitation program and we received some funding for that because we passed some legislation due to our first five um, Nebraska partners um, to get more funding um, for that um, for Douglas County and for um, McVee um, expansion. And um, there is now an ability, we don't have um, medical providers before, if you called into the CPS hotline, it was an automatic um, referral into um, the child welfare system. And now that has been removed. And now we're working on what Shadi was mentioning, another state has is a warm line helpline. And it's being it's due this December. And we have lots of partners that we're going in on to try to make sure this is all in place so that the unnecessary call is not made to begin with. And again, I just want to say a lot of things about this this slide, but um, the Bridge Family Center Resource Network that is available, um, it's, it's in places that have the most um, need um, impacted individuals. It has both our young adults leading efforts as well as our parents that have been part of this to say what needs to be in place there, but also has the central navigation system. How am I doing on time? I can't see the chat, but 
I'm sure I'm over, but finally, here's the statewide you are not plan. Over. You're good. Okay. You, you, you got two minutes. Okay, statewide plan. Next slide. Um, we have been wanting um, to make sure this is happening across Nebraska, especially when we're working on the system policies and practices and getting more partners on, on board. Um, our DHHS partner is now funding um, the collaboratives themselves in, in a $6 million um, amount a year to utilize some of the state general funds and, and TANF funds into the future, because as you can see, a lot of this is concrete supports and true prevention. Um, and we have a statewide plan that everybody's contributing to with their commitments and their own community goals that feed up into four major goals that we know can be, if it's in place, can really make um, our data continue to look um, better and also address the most disparities and disproportionality that we see in Nebraska. So one more slide um, is our is our rates of child abuse and neglect and and out of home care that are entering um, each year. You can see in 2012, we had 2,799. And just most recently getting, looking at the 2023 numbers at the end of the year, we had 1,797. So over a thousand um, families not having to be separated and children and, and families being supported in this new way is really what this is intended to do and we're excited to keep this number going down but also put everything in place that can be possible to strengthen families and that is it thank you very much jenny thank you very much um this was this was just wonderful i'm i'm so excited about the work that you've done here and just this slide looking at the numbers is um really impressive and phenomenal so Thank you so much for being willing to come and share. We've got a couple of questions that are going to be um, asked of you later. And um, we're going to move now to our next presenter. Are we ready? Yes. Mary? There you are. Nice. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. All right, everybody. This is Mary Coogan. Um, Mary is from New Jersey, and she's going to talk about their um, initiative here as well. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Tate, and thank you, Bill, for hosting this webinar and inviting me. Advocates for Children of New Jersey is a multi-issue organization. We've been around for 45 years. Our mission is to advance and strengthen policies and programs that promote equitable opportunities for all children. So one thing I do want people to understand is while there are 21 counties in New Jersey, we actually, uh, many of our systems are statewide. So our courts, our public assistance programs, um, our juvenile justice system. And so the rules and laws are implemented. Um, some counties have different ways and strategies of implementing, but they are looking at uh, state rules and regulations. So our goal was a little bit different in that our court system and our juvenile justice system and our child protective service uh, agency had been doing a lot of training and work around implicit bias, looking at structural racism, and had been looking at data to uh, try to address the overrepresentation of children and families of color in those state systems. So ACNJ, in working with our New Jersey Department of Children and Families, took the approach that we were going to try to identify state and county infrastructures and statewide committees and task force and work groups that make decisions regarding services or assistance to the PN to age three population directly or to their families and um, any services related to maternal and child health, early care and education and child welfare and see how we might better integrate those systems. Um, and thinking that we really had too many. And there were oftentimes many different groups working on similar goals. So in, in an effort to do that, we thought we might also be able to eliminate barriers to parents accessing the services that they've identified as what they need for their children and themselves to thrive. And then we wanted to try to create some type of a feedback loop so that there would be feedback from parents on how to improve those services and continue to reduce barriers to access. So we did a legislative review of existing entities and task force, and that helped us identify 
three main entities to focus on for the because of their focus on the PN to three population. Can I have the first slide? So these entities are listed here. The first, we have three regional maternal child health consortia, which are separate nonprofit organizations. They are licensed by the New Jersey Department of Health and funded by the hospitals that provide maternity services and to families, uh, some grants and some state dollars, and they are regulated by the Department of Health. Their primary function is to provide prevention activities, consumer and professional education, data analysis, infant and pediatric follow-up, and coordination of transportation systems and the development of a comprehensive plan. The consortia also are lead agencies together with other community organizations to um, connect the PN to three population and their families to services through what we call the Connecting NJ Hubs, which is the second item listed on your slide. The hubs use a county-based single point of entry system for families to access prenatal care providers and community services with a goal of helping their families thrive. Some of the hubs are funded by the New Jersey Department of Health and others are funded by the New Jersey Department of Children and Families. First Lady Tammy Murphy had made the hubs a focus of her Nurture NJ campaign, which was aimed at reducing disparities and ensuring equitable access to maternal and infant health care. Parents can access programs such as evidence-based home visiting services, referrals for health care, early childhood and family services, and get linked to community programs that might provide things like diapers, food, um, or also child care. The Department of Children and Families also provides funds for case management staff, early childhood specialists, and for those who are in the process of helping us roll out our universal home visiting, there are also community alignment specialists. The referral services through the hubs are free for mothers, fathers, and parents who are caring for children and guardians, and the idea is to do a warm hand, handoff to the community uh, provider. The last group on your slide is the County Council for the Young Children. Now they were created to bring parents and providers and county leaders together to identify the needs of families of young children in that county and make recommendations regarding the service array within the community and to hopefully in that process strengthen the collaboration between parents, families, and the local community providers in the areas of health, family, and early education. And also for some of them, they help promote parent leadership and support at the local level. The county councils employ different mechanisms such as surveys and focus groups to gather feedback from parents and providers to inform their own work and to inform other assessments. And in talking to many of them, it appears that the providers are often the ones doing the training for the parents. So we met with different county councils, we met with the consortia, we met with people working on the hubs, um, and then tried to visit some of the sites, either virtually or in person. So next slide. Here's what we learned. Those staffing the county councils were very committed to engaging and partnering with parents to help their families thrive. The more successful county councils were connected to other entities, such as the Connecting NJ hubs, for the County Child Care Resource and Referral Network. Parents identified issues through their health and education subcommittees and the community partners provided the training for the most part. Parents also in different county councils had advocated for issues that they thought were important with the assistance of the staff at the county council, such as providing a guide for the County Department of Human Services and how that worked, but a guide that the parents would actually understand. One county actually um, advocated for a change in the bus route because parents were having problems getting to the locations they needed to get. Um, there was another county provided training for parents to get their child care, care certificate, thus improving parent skills and, and creating some potential job opportunities. Funding was a concern on most of the counties to take on some additional work because these county councils are funded by the preschool development grant from both from birth to age five through the administration for children and families. Next slide. So in front of you are two models that seem to work. Like I said, the county councils where you were integrating the hub, the county council 
into another organization. So it almost became a one-stop shop for parents that seemed to be the most helpful. The first one, Project Self-Sufficiency, that's a nonprofit in a rural county, Sussex County in New Jersey. And going there to visit them and talking to people there, they seem to be very um, integrated. Among their pro programs, they integrate child and family-based services, including home visiting and the early childhood specialist. They help parents who struggle with transportation. And they also are the lead for their county council for young children and their connecting NJ hub. They also have something else, which in our state is known as a family success center. These are funded in large part by the Department of Children and Families, and then they can seek other grant funding. These are one-stop shops that provide wraparound resources and supports for families. The idea before they find themselves in crisis, they um, can offer primary child abuse prevention services to families. They bring together community residents to sort of identify what issues are of concern and where they need to act. Um, there's no cost to accessing services through the family success centers. And they try to be a warm and welcoming environment and to families providing family-friendly activities and resources such as job training, literacy training, um, enrollment in healthcare programs, et cetera. The other is program for parents. Now that is located in New Jersey's largest county here in Essex County. They are also the, the leading childcare resource and referral agency in Essex County. Um, and that connects families with children to childcare programs, school age programs, as well as community resources, such as housing, rental assistance, uh, homeless shelters, food pantries, et cetera. Again, sort of a one-stop shop. The Essex County Council for the Young Children is also located within programs for parents, and they have a robust training, leadership training program for parents. And they also have a um, family engagement network, which is sort of a, a learning network for um, families, for organizations in the community who want to learn how to engage families, how they can do that and meet any state or federal standards that a grant might require. So the County Resource and Referral Agency, which is available in every county, they provide information regarding different types of childcare programs, other social ser service programs, and um, administer what we call our childcare subsidy program, which helps uh, income eligible families with the cost of childcare. Um, and they also provide training and technical assistance to child care providers. So while ACNJ, we were not successful in creating the continuous feedback loop that we wanted, um, the individual entities continued to collect feedback and much has been learned and the partnerships have been developed and the work continues. Next slide. So I wanna spend some of my remaining time talking about other efforts underway in New Jersey which are seeking to improve service delivery and to partner with parents in developing programs and services that they identify um, as what they need to make sure that their families can thrive. So we are the beneficiary of a grant from the Pritzker Children's Initiative, which is very much appreciated. And through that, we developed what we're referring to as our Unlocking Potential or UP Coalition. So the UP Coalition, plan was actually developed by members of our parent leadership council, as well as through focus groups of parents in five marginalized areas of the state that we wanted to engage in this effort. Through that work and also the work of our state partners, which include parents, um, departments and agencies, as well as community organizations, the UP Coalition identified their vision and mission, which is to prioritize the voices of expected parents, caregivers, and service providers as the driving force for prenatal to eight services. The UP Coalition envisions a world where their collective effort results in strong, more equitable communities where every child thrives and families find support and opportunity. Together, this team will foster empowerment and racial equity to transform the future generation, the future of generations to come. So there are four aims of the UP Coalition. The first is to lift up parent and provider voice. 
The second is to step up maternal infant health care and family supports. The third, raise up high quality early care and education for infants and toddlers. And the fourth is to build up systems, resources, and a culturally diverse workforce. The goals of the UP Coalition are to make sure that voices of parents and service providers statewide are valued and utilized to inform the PN to three policy and programming, that all women are able to receive adequate prenatal care for themselves and their children, including home visiting, maternal depression screenings, breastfeeding, food assistance, and nutrition, that families with infants and toddlers have access to high quality childcare options based on parental choice, that there is a robust bus supply of PN to three services deemed essential by families residing in the selected communities and that they are accessible to families and that the PN plan will evolve as the state and local and family leaders learn more of the needs of families and what is feasible to achieve. The second thing I want to talk about is the New Jersey Task Force on Child Abuse and Neglect. I actually um, currently co-chair that task force with the Commissioner of the Department of Children and Families. Um, that is made up of representation from a lot of state agencies and departments, but also people in the community, and including um, public members, parents, and youth. There is a subcommittee on race, poverty, and neglect which has been looking at ways to reduce, again, the overrepresentation of kids of color in the child welfare system. New Jersey has, and we've had presentations on this over the past couple of years, implemented most of the programs which are considered poverty reducing programs, which do help strengthen families and get families out of the child welfare system or keep them from being involved in the child welfare system, except that our data is showing that we still have an overrepresentation. So we recently had a conference in October um, and tried to facilitate, well, not tried, we did have a conversation with the groups of people that are typical mandated reporters in New Jersey. We are all mandated reporters in our state, but the high volumes of calls to the child abuse hotline come from law enforcement, medical providers, and educators, similar to most states. So sharing the data with them um, about, and this is probably similar to most states, about 80% of the calls to the hotline concern allegations of neglect. Approximately 80% of those calls, um, I'm sorry, are of allegations of neglect. However, of the let's say 67,000 neglect reports investigated on an annual basis, less than 4%, probably closer to 3.5% um, are actually, actually result in a finding of neglect. Um, and then when you look at the percentages in terms of uh, demographics, the data shows that 30% uh, of the neglect reports involve Black children, when only 13.5% of New Jersey children are Black or African American. 32% of the reports involve Hispanic children, who comprise 29% of all New Jersey children. And 43% or 43.8% of the New Jersey child population um, are white, but only 29% of the reported child abuse and neglect allegations um, are children, are white children. So the question really is how to reduce the data, reduce the surveillance and, and um, investigation of families similar to what Nebraska was trying to do because that causes unnecessary trauma. So in having the conversation, we looked at common scenarios and then we've also had We've been having some focus groups with these reporters and also having surveys to kind of get a sense of why they make the reports, what is, what's the, the result they are looking for, and then we're going to come back together in 2025 to determine the next steps to address the overrepresentation. Mary? Your mic is muted right now. Okay, there you go. Thanks. Sorry. Um, you got Monmouth, one minute. Monmouth Axe is a county-based approach 
their um, their goal is serving you better together. They are looking to help residents who need county resources access those resources, but their principles in terms of implementing is to make sure there is a consistent resident and community voice in every step of the process, bending the curve away from crisis response and toward family supports and prevention, building systems and responses which promote racial and ethnic equity, assisting communities through organized systems of service, and building resilient communities use, utilizing trauma-informed practices. So I really would encourage people to check out their website. And the final thing is uh, New Jersey Safe Babies Court Teams, which as many of you know, is an approach that was developed by zero to three. We have it in three counties here in New Jersey. And what it does is these are involving families who have entered the system because of abuse or neglect or at, are at risk of entering foster the foster care system. But it is a judge led and um, approach staffed by a full time community coordinator. And the idea is to really um, provide wraparound supports to the family. And what they have shown, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is that it is a faster time to permanency in New Jersey. They've achieved reunification and families have not re-involved with the system because they have been connected to the community resources, which will allow them to successfully continue and thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, lots of information. Once again, it's uh, just a, a great presentation and so happy that you mentioned the Safe Baby Court teams, their particular favorite of mine. Um, and uh, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to take the slides down and the three presenters and I are just going to have a conversation for a few minutes. And um, let's see. Okay. All righty. We're working with our uh, layout here, but we're getting there. Um, so uh, the three of you have worked together for a while. All right, there we go. There's all four of us. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, the three of you have worked together, and um, and so what you know, which is a a wonderful opportunity for us to have all of you here together at the same time. I want to ask you guys um a couple of questions, just you know, for discussion among ourselves, uh, you know, and three hundred other people, but. <laughs> but but I wanted to start with this, you know, a couple of years ago when I started this work, one of my mentors um, um, who was my, started as my mentor at um, the uh, Department of Children and Family Services in Illinois, he, um, he asked me at the beginning of this, he said, do you think that the child welfare department can do its own prevention work? And at the time, I hadn't really thought a whole lot about prevention, <laughs> um, except in its, you know, sort of really concrete ways. Um, but as the years go by and I've learned more, I understand that the answer to that is no. And so I thought I would ask you guys, um, um, how do you how do you answer that question? Um, what does it actually take? Because I think you know what we're seeing is a lot more than what we might ordinarily have thought that it needed to look like? And how do you get um, people to understand that it is also their business, um, that child welfare pre uh, prevention is not just the business of the child welfare department, it is also their business. Um, so I just wanted to ask you guys to talk, to talk to those points a little bit. Whoever wants to go first. I mean, I'll start. I agree with you. I think that a child protective service system, which has a hotline, they sort of get branded, right? That's what their reputation is. And I know even in New Jersey, as much as we went from the Division of Youth and Family Services to the Division of Child Protection and Permanency, it's still DIFUS, right? I mean, that's what people look at it. And they look at it as a worker coming to their home who well-intended wants to help them is going to take their child away. So I think that's why we've looked at other things in terms of calling it the Connecting NJ Hub, um, trying to find the Family Success Centers, which are not 
while they might be funded by our Department of Children and Families, they are not um, labeled as such. They're more independent, and that may give parents um, a better sense that this is a community provider and somebody is not really surveilling them, right? Mm -hmm. But I right. think that is a constant struggle, and it's something that we've talked a lot about in the UP Coalition and talking to parents who are in many instances, always going to hesitate because even when they've gone to public programs, if they are families of color, there's a greater chance that someone from Child Protective Services is going to be knocking on their door. Yes. Yes. Shetty, were you going to? No, I think that's all right. I think from our perspective, one, we you know, we look at the history of, of policies and systems. And when we do that, we can see, um, we can see the harms that systems like child welfare have, um, have perpetrated on families and on communities. And so I think it's really important to understand the history of, of these systems and what they have meant for families and family separation. Um, and so that's one piece of it is just making sure people understand that um, historically, this is, this has not been a system that has that has been helpful to families. More often, it has harmed them. Um, so that's one piece. I think the other is that child welfare can't be the solution. It has to be part of the the um, the process or the thinking about solutions, right? So there's a, there's a contribution I think that that child welfare can make in terms of we talked about the data that they can bring to understanding families' needs around the resources they can contribute to problem solving, but that ultimately the solutions have to really be in community and in these upstream systems. And I think when we're having conversations across the continuum, it's really important to be able to show how it's the failures of upstream systems that have led families into deeper end systems like child welfare. So I think we have to look at where those gaps and needs are for families. And when we have failed them, we create this sort of what we call like cascading kind of failures of these upstream systems that are really supposed to be there to support all families that then push them deeper and deeper. So I think it's creating that shared understanding of what families need, that families are best served in communities, what the data has told us about the failures of some of these systems and where the solutions need to be. Need to be. Yes, for sure. Thank you. Jenny, were you going to say something here? I probably don't have anything more to add. It, they were really on point, but I would say the systems that have been created that are higher end systems are were made for a purpose that is different than what a community itself needs to create, right? You, it's about belonging hope, connection, relationships, being inclusive, knowing your neighbors, whatever all that is, that can't be up to a community child well or a child welfare system to create on its own. And but then the even the services, they're so much relatable to more public health and to churches and to you name it again, partners that I think I saw a question about engagement. I think once you start showing the return on investments, even in the model that we've been doing or the benefits to the society or to that community to thrive and to actually continue to grow, especially in rural, rural Nebraska. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not mandatory. It's that people want to change the trajectory and get to these outcomes. And it's been um, really important because I don't think prevention could ever be thought of, or especially a prevention system as one system alone to change and to be able to adopt. Yes, definitely agree with you on that. So one of the things that's characteristic of everything that we heard um, from you guys today um, is the importance of engaging families and um you have lived experience partners. Um, you have community members that are engaged in your decision-making processes. Can, can you guys speak a little bit about how important that has been? Um, you know, how you think it added to and, and contributed to what you eventually ended up creating? Um, and I don't know who might want to take that first, but um, family engagement, community engagement, lived experience partners, very big. Um, component of, of the work that you've been doing. Uh, 
I was going to say, Jennifer, why don't you go first? I, I could do that. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, again, we started right away engaging the young adults and the parents that were impacted. And we still see that young adults, because of the bias and the unfortunate circumstances that a lot of our young adults aging out of foster care um, are experiencing that they, when they're having children, they are getting reported into the child abuse and neglect hotline. And we have to make sure that they are involved in these co-created solutions. It's just, it's everything. They've not only been impacted from what they experienced, but also they want to return and, and oftentimes try to return to their families and they see the needs that their families have. And so we have to look at those cross-generational families and those supports in this community-driven way. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, even just from a community meeting we had with lived experience partners sharing how this has changed and the impact that they've had, it's about hope. It's about, they never mm -hmm. thought anyone believed in them, you know, that they mm -hmm. now have this opportunity to even change careers and get into um, the supports that they've always wanted, having four kids and being a single mom. And that whole thing is, is changed. And then they will also want to support other parents that are in that. So I think it's all about, it is the absolute change. It's the absolute change that is needed for not only it's, it's the social probably mirror we need to be looking at when it comes to, are we really at a prevention place if we don't have all lived experience partners really contributing to the solutions? Yes. Yes, good question. All right, I'm gonna ask you guys a couple of questions from our audience. Um, one is, um, obviously you both talked about lots of organizations being involved. Um, and one of the questions um, that our audience member has is, how are these organizations motivated to cooperate or to participate? Um, are there requirements or? Just how do you go about motivating the different organizations to join your collaboratives or your networks or those things? So I'll start. I think for some people, it's because they're as frustrated, they want to see change, right? And so, but they also will stick with it when they see progress being made. Um, I think sometimes you have some grant funding which can help a grassroots organization. And I think that is important because it's the grassroots organizations that know the people in the community and I think can help prioritize what the focus might be. Um, and I think even with the, they need to me in the same thing with the parents and youth, I think they need to feel that they're being listened to, that they're going to be part of the process and that, you're, you're going to implement the changes that they suggest so that they are an equal partner in this process. I think that's really important. Anybody else want to address that? How do you motivate the organizations? Now, well, let me ask you this other question. This question, um, uh, Shadi, this is for you, um, which is a question about, you, you mentioned about um, using child welfare fair dollars in upstream kind of ways. Can you say a little bit more about that and um, how do you, how how can one do that? How can a system do that? And what changes have to be made in order to allow the um, different kind of use for those um, dollars? So I think maybe that was in reference specifically to the the support line. I don't have the details on how that how they managed to do that. And I think Jenny, you you all have done something similar. Um, so I don't know if you have any insights you want to share in terms of how that financing worked. I think part of it is just this uh, willingness to think creatively about your your dollars and and what you're financing and what you're willing to invest in and to have the conversations um, about how to how to leverage those dollars. And so we often talk about the braiding and bundling and thinking creatively about your financing. But I think some of it is just having those conversations. For instance, as I mentioned in this particular conversation, it was about 
you know, wanting to put in an investment, but also feeling as though they had to be a part of, you know, it had to be something that they had to own, right? Like we need to have the number be a DHS number. It actually doesn't. You can think about how, what ways you can contribute your dollars so that um, they're part of that solution that you're building. But I don't have the specifics on that particular jurisdiction. I don't know, Jenny, if you have any insights, um, I can certainly get more on that. It, I can talk about the partnership we have with our Department of Health and Human Services. It's promoting safe and stable families dollars. It's um, our CBCAP um, dollars. There's additional 4B dollars that go into this system. Um, TANF SSBG dollars, as well as now TANF um, dollars that will be going in and then state general funds. I think those Thank all you. flow through the, the department. And now the the FFPSA, they're supporting um, the central navigation function or will or planning to in the collaboratives. And they're also going to be able to support the motivational interviewing practice that it takes to get at those concrete supports and other needs um, in a holistic way. Mm -hmm. and I think we have a comment that in New York, they're also, um, I think they're anticipating being able to be reimbursed through Family First for you. Yes, yes. Which is, you know, why that that uh, federal program was actually created to use the funds previously used for foster care in these other more preventive ways, right? Um, Correct. So but I know initially New Jersey struggled because we had what the state wanted to use as its matching dollars. They wouldn't allow it. I think they're, mm -hmm. it, it, and I also think they were limited initially in terms of what programs could be used. And I think that is expanding yeah. and people are starting to think outside the box. But like with everything else, people have to be comfortable with changing how they do things and talking to their colleagues at other departments and, and trusting that people are gonna move forward together. Absolutely. Um, I have another question for Jennifer. Um, have you explored having the bridge program partner with Help Me Grow or 211? Um, yeah. Something like that? Yeah, I should have talked more about that whole piece. Our Help Me Grow was supported by the Pritzker and the prenatal three plans. Um, we put it in our, into our PDG um, application and unfortunately it did not get funded um, this round. So those that got PDG, congrats. Um, so we are, we are working with it inside of our, with our medical providers and in the system that I talked about with central navigation and our 211 and find help system already. So we just have to keep the, the screening, um, and the providers engaged enough without some of the dollars that we had put into the PG, PDG grant. So we're hoping it's still there. I'm not sure it's going to be as formal as we had it as the help me grow, system and being part of that network just because of the dollars, but it it's exactly what's needed in that early childhood system. Yes, yes. Other states are starting to do that too. Um, I wanna ask um, about CCRNRs. Um, and I, I think maybe both of you mentioned it uh, in your programs, I'm not sure, but we did get a specific question in our during our registration process, um, if you see a role for CCRNRs. So since you guys, Mentioned them, I assume the answer is yes. And then maybe you could speak a little bit to how that works. So I would say yes, because if parents are, so in New Jersey, the CCRNR is typically an agency in the community. And so parents are aware of that agency. And so to the extent the agency who in New Jersey qualifies the parent to be eligible for a subsidy payment for childcare, but also provides training for family child care providers, child care centers, um, does some of the, the licensing requirements in terms of, you know, so that people are in compliance, what they need to do to open up a center. Um, but also, like I explained the one example, they are also referring parents to other resources in the community. You can mm -hmm. turn that into sort of a one-stop shop, right? But with all of these, and New Jersey has tried different iterations, it, to me, what I'm taking from all our um, experiments, what I'm going to say is you really need to be talking to the parent. Where is the location that they would go to? Where is the central location for them? Is it the Family Success Center or is it the CCRNR or is it some other entity, what we're calling the Connecting NJ Hub? 
And that's sort of where we are now because people can go to 10 different places and may get referred to 10 different places before yeah. they get the services that they actually think they need. Yes, for sure. Anything else on the uh, CCR and ours? Well, let me ask for the last question. Um, how can people start in their own local communities, um, leveraging their public and private and philanthropic partnerships um, to and to, to really support their grassroots organizations and get them going if someone in their own communities wants to start working on this? Where should they start? I don't know who wants to start with that question. Shadi, maybe we'll ask you to start with that question. <laughs> So, I, I mean, I think that may be better suited to our local partners, because I think you guys are doing the work of thinking about how to really support grassroots um, partnerships and work. I mean, I think partnerships are essential. I think we everyone has a role, right? Like, I think philanthropy certainly has a role. Um, I think moving into, uh, you know, the next few years, we're really going to have to think together and, and really partner in terms of thinking about solutions, both protecting and preserving what we have, but also looking at um, how we can continue to do the work of reimagining um, the ways we support families. But I would I would look to our um, local partners for their ideas here. So, yes, I mean, when I was, the reason why I brought up Monmouth Acts, which is a county, but that was the County Department of Social Services trying to figure out how they could do outreach to a community that was very different demographics than what that county had initially been. Mm -hmm. And they were finding they weren't reaching the Spanish speaking families, right? Because they traditionally wouldn't come out. And so I, my sense is going to churches, going to, or any other faith-based or faith-based organization and talking with people who are the people in the community that people look to, I think is a great place to start. And and when you kind of decide what your plan is, I know here in New Jersey that we have, we're fortunate that we have some funders, right? Local mm -hmm. funders. But I think once you have a plan, if you go to a local funder, sometimes people can combine things. There's funders that want to, you know, take whatever resources they have and work together to make a change. And so they know each other. So, but I think, it is good to start with the agencies, if you can, that are doing some of the work, the faith-based or the sorry, the faith-based organizations. Mm -hmm. But I think you also should try to involve your county boards of social services that do the programming. And then I do think it's good to touch base with either your Department of Health or your Child Protective Service Agency, because most of them are trying to do outreach and could help facilitate, you know, getting coverage on certain things because they know the regulations and they know what you have to do to make sure you get payment. So even a Medicaid office, right? I think many of them are trying to stretch limited funds as far as they can, but they know what you yeah. need to do to make that funding cover some type of service. Mm -hmm. Good, good advice. Well, we're just about at time. I just thought I would ask for a final thought from each of you, a very brief final thought, something you want to share with our audience um, and um, before we wrap up. The older I get, the more I learn. So we can never <laughs> stop learning. <laughs> I love that. That is so true. <laughs> Thank you for that. Shadi or Jay, a final thought. Yeah, I, I think, would. Oh, go ahead. Thanks, Shadi. I I agree with the learning. There's so much more that can be done here. I was thinking about even uh, exercise we did with a longstanding collaborative the other day about the disruptive thinking um, and challenging. It's called the TRIZ. I'm sure many have done it, but it's amazing to to really think about all the things that we know is what we need to do and we know what's right. Like we, Shadi, you laid it all out, right? But how hard sometimes it is to get there and to really say that we are needing to change this whole thing, you know? And so anyways, thank you for the moment and, and time. Appreciate it. Thank you. 
Jenny, it looks like I you would, get the last word. Yeah, I would just say thank you to Jenny and Mary and everyone else who's doing this work. It, it, it does, often Jenny does feel easy to say this is the work that needs to happen. It's a lot harder to see it happen. And I think we've been humbled by, you know, the opportunity to be a part of the work that you all have done, really trying to do this, uh, this work of coming together to creating the, to create a shared vision to really think about how we support families and have a continuum that that makes sure families don't fall through and I think you know we just have to keep going and keep uh being creative and you know know that it takes time and we have to just continue to to sustain that commitment and have that clear vision of where we're trying to go absolutely words of wisdom thank you all three of you this has been so um, enlightening and also encouraging. So thank you for your work and uh, thank you for being here to share it with us today. Um, that is it for us. We are wrapping up. We would like to um, remind everybody that there's going to be a survey that was going to pop up in your browser when we're done. We would very much like for you to fill out the survey. Um, but beyond that, thank you so much for being here. Um, we hope that you enjoyed the information that was provided. And uh, also, I hope that you can feel the commitment um, from the folks that have talked with you today. All right. Thanks, everybody.